So excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for coming to our meeting today where we're gonna focus on the blue economy and how it can work to advance gender equality in SDG five. So we're gonna talk about uh, today, some of the ways women can get better access to equal opportunities in the blue economy. And as you probably know, the blue economy um, encompasses sustainable economic activity related to the ocean. And it's been estimated that the value of key services every year coming from the ocean is somewhere between one and a half and six trillion dollars per year. So that puts it in the order of magnitude of the size of any one of the top 10 countries in our world in, in, in terms of their economies. Um, but at the same time, there's reports showing us that access to ocean resources and sectors is rarely equitably distributed. So addressing, the, uh, addressing inequalities and preventing the widening of inequalities um, going forward is a critical part of achieving the SDG agenda. So on that note, it's my honor to introduce Donna Bertarelli, who is special advisor for the blue economy at UNCTAD. And that's the part of the UN dealing with trade, investment and development. In her position as special advisor, Mrs. Bertarelli promotes a sustainable and regenerative blue economy. She's a brilliant spokesman for the ocean and clearly has a deep love for it. Um, you may or may not know that she holds the record for the fastest woman ever to sail around the world. She's a noted philanthropist, ocean conservationist and entrepreneur. Donna, we look forward to hearing from you about why we should care about gender equality in the blue economy and what we can do about it. Welcome Donna and thanks so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Around the world, women are excessively affected by climate change, by market fluctuations or shocks like the pandemic, which has put millions of jobs at risk. Gender equality matters for women and men in and out of the workforce, for girls and boys about to explore their potential, for governments and the private sector hoping for economic recovery. Women's rights are human rights and governments and business need to ensure their equal representation. Not only is this a just cause, but economies grow when women prosper. And when women are economically empowered, the gender gap narrows. Advancing gender equality could add an estimated $13 trillion to global GDP in 2030. So how can the blue economy help advance gender equality? SDG 14, life below water is essential for a blue economy, but also directly impacts the status of women by advancing SDG 5. And in fact, many other SDGs, poverty, hunger, education, health, and climate change. Women make up most of the workforce in coastal and maritime tourism and fisheries, the main blue economy sectors. Yet, they are in the lowest paid, lowest status, and least protected jobs. In small island developing states, tourism accounts for 30 to 80% of total exports, with the participation of women as high as 54%. But most work in low skilled, casual, and temporary jobs. As for the fisheries and aquaculture sector, women's contribution is overlooked and undervalued. They play a key role in ensuring a reliable supply of food from the ocean, which 3 billion people depend on for their daily source of protein. There's a disparity of work and pay by gender, with women having a significant presence in processing but not in fisheries management or ocean decision-making bodies. Many don't have equal access to opportunities, resources, financing, market information, technology, training, mobility, and bargaining power. And that has a negative impact on food security. If you take a few examples, in the Republic of Kiribati, in a small island developing state, 70% of households participate in the fishery sector. Women are not socially expected to fish at sea due to the perceived dangers involved. Instead, they're heavily involved in shore-based activities and increasingly 
engaged in the marketing and sales of fish. Nevertheless, UNCTAD research indicates women struggle to participate in domestic and international trade. In the Gambia, as an example of coastal state, 10% of the population depends on fish processing and marketing. UNCTAD research reveals that about 80% of fish processors are women. Here, women could benefit from increased access to equipment, credit, and support services, or from improving their skills in marketing or safety and hygiene to meet EU market regulations, for example. UNCTAD's work shows there is an untapped potential for women in the blue economy if we improve gender equality in the tourism and fishery sectors alone. But just imagine how much more we could do by diversifying in new areas like sustainable aquaculture, renewable energy, blue carbon, marine bioprospection, and conservation. Innovation and technology are needed to support ocean and coastal restoration and protection, which are often community-led. So imagine if we integrate women throughout all of these areas. A change in mindset is needed, just as changes in policies are needed. Growing a sustainable and resilient blue economy by fully including women's potential will benefit society and the economy and in turn advance all of the 17 SDGs. Thank you. Donna, thank you so much for the work that you do. It's inspiring to hear you and you're right that everything improves when women are empowered. So I'm Suzanne Johnson. Welcome to everybody. I'm Senior Advisor for the UN Global Compact and the work that it does around the sustainable ocean business. We're in a growing world, our land is getting used up, and we need to expand the use of our oceans and the industry around it. We need to feed ourselves, we need to get energy from the ocean, we need to provide transportation for people and to facilitate trade. But at the same time as we're scaling up ocean industry and productivity, we need to do it in the right way. We need to prevent environmental degradation. We need to use it to fight climate change. And we need to give access to women, really, and all people to good opportunities in the ocean economy. So our platform at the Global Compact, um, we have identified what we call the five tipping points. And these cover critical areas for ocean business opportunity. And much of our work is focused on advancing these tipping points in the ocean economy. These include increasing sustainable seafood, scaling up offshore renewables, decarbonizing the world shipping fleet, and mapping the ocean with data. Oh yes, and also of course, enter, uh, ending waste entering the ocean. Um, all of these five tipping points provide a great amount of opportunity for both men and women. So I'm delighted today to welcome this panel to share their thoughts about what can be done to address gender equity in the ocean economy. We're going to hear from a wide variety of points coming from ocean science and research, regulation, industry, and entrepreneurial innovation. First, I'd like to turn to our first panelist, Henrik Osterblom. Henrik, you're the science director for the Stockholm Resilience Center. You're creator of CBOS, which is an initiative um, to drive a more responsible seafood industry. And you actually were also one of the lead authors on the recent high level panel uh, report, blue paper they call them, for the sustainable ocean economy um, around ocean equity. So I was wondering if you could start by setting the scene. Can you talk with us a little bit about this blue paper on ocean equity? And also Henrik, tell us a little bit about its findings around gender equality. Yeah, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, nice to have this opportunity to speak to you. Again, I was one of the coordinating uh, authors of the blue paper for the high level panel, which is, if you're not familiar with it, uh, a group of 14 heads of state who are interested in engaging with uh, new uh, sustainable ocean policies based on science and the scientific report on equity that we described to them includes uh, lots of information on equity in general, including gender equity, of course. Some of the findings that are presented in the report is that 
at the macroeconomic scale, of course, countries that are more equal in gender also tend to have a higher economic growth and are more dynamic. And from a scientific perspective, I also know that more gender equal group are more dynamic and interesting to work with. So there's clearly an efficiency and creativity gain from gender equity. But the report also finds that inequity is systemic in the ocean economy. It's embedded in the political and economic system, and it's a result of historical legacies and prevailing norms. So it's really fundamentally established as the normal for the ocean economy to be unequal and with limited opportunities for, for women, indigenous people, and other groups. We know that this has negative effect on, on well being and opportunity. And we know that. Uh, uh, there are ways to address these issues. I think that's the, that's the key thing that comes out of this report, that we know how to address gender inequalities. We know how to address gender issues in the ocean economy, but it's a big effort. And, and many of the more accommodating approaches to uh, empowering women really do not address the fundamental challenges but there are what scientists call gender transformative approaches where you really take on a systemic and holistic uh, approach and really work with communities and, and work with the historical norms and the established ways of doing business and really illustrating that there are ways to empower women. There are ways to make sure you address the root causes that result in the gender inequities. So this is the report that we presented to the high-level panel. And of course, we were very excited to see when the recommendations from the 14 heads of state come out that really puts a strong emphasis on equity. So equity is becoming much more of a central mainstream issue in international ocean policies, which is very exciting. And clearly, there is a strong opportunity for businesses to also play a key role in leading a more gender equal uh, ocean economy by promoting women, creating opportunities for women to lead senior position and really illustrate that an ocean economy that's more gender equal is also a more dynamic and creative economy. So thank you very much for that. And I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, Henrik, thank you very much. Yeah, it's interesting. Equity, you say equity is becoming a more mainstream issue uh, in policy and business, um, and that you have identified some transformational ways to address these issues. Um, so you also talk about you know, the systemic challenges. And uh, let me turn now to Heike Degum, who you work at the Global Shipping Regulator the International Maritime Organization. And Henrik talked about some of the uh, big the big challenges um, in dealing with equity here. And um, the statistics in maritime industry are striking. Um, currently, 2% of seafarers are women, and the vast majority of this 2% work in the cruise industry. And so I'd be curious to know, because I know you think about this a lot, what is the IMO doing to advance gender equality in the maritime industry? And what, in your view, are some of the actions that could be taken um, to make a difference? Heike. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, you have already taken out of my mouth the statistics I was uh, going to start with, uh, and it's, it's perfectly correct. 2% uh, of all seafarers worldwide are women at the moment, which is, of course, very little. Shipping traditionally being a very male oriented profession probably has one of the most uh, of the, the greatest imbalances there uh, where gender is concerned as a profession. What uh, are we doing at the International Maritime Organization to redress this? We have campaigns every year to get young people into shipping related professions. That is not only seafaring, that's everything else connected with shipping, ports, uh, stevedores, uh, charterers. There are many, many fields directly related to shipping. There has been over the last decade, I would say, a, a shortage of skilled seafarers, and that's getting more pronounced by the year. Seafaring is not a profession that appeals to young people. Bringing more women in can definitely redress this um, 
the, the imbalance that uh, gender-wise exists, but also address the problem of the uh, reducing numbers of people willing to go to sea. Having a career at sea does not mean that you have to spend all your life on a ship. On the contrary, uh, most seafarers nowadays are on, at sea for a certain amount of time, and they are actually very sought after specialists when it comes to switching to a profession on land that is often, of course, also connected to seafaring. These people, these skills are not normally present in the, in the normal population, so they are really sought after. We have at IMO a women in maritime program that has been running for 32 years now and is supporting uh, with mainly with fellowships, uh, women to train for uh, seafaring or seafaring related professions. For, uh, for this purpose, we have also helped in the founding of regional organizations that are women in maritime associations, VMAS as we call them, we have seven grassroots uh, organizations now up and running, quite active uh, in all the, the continents of the world. The, the real push in the matter came, of course, with the uh, SDGs being uh, approved and issued by the UN and especially SDG uh, 5 that has given us also a big push in developments in shipping. We had in 2019, Every year we choose a maritime theme for the year. And in 2019, we had the first time a theme that addressed women in shipping. It was called Empowering Women in the Maritime Community. This had a much, much bigger impact than we could ever have imagined. Actually, many, many people latched on to this, uh, our IMO member states, but also a number of international organizations. As a consequence, we had the first uh, women-oriented uh, NGO joining IMO as a, a consultative member, that is VISTA, the Women's International Shipping and Trading Associations, and they are very active. They have uh, staged many, many events uh, at IMO. They take active part in our meetings and are all around promoting the um, deployment of, of women in shipping. Currently, we have a survey going together with VISTA IMO and WISTA to get concrete data actually on uh, women and their positions in shipping and in which areas they concentrate and where exactly they are working. Uh, that is not only maritime, but also ocean uh, related activities such as uh, fishing. And we will hear about this uh, a bit later from uh, other panelists. We have also, uh, for the first time, issued an assembly resolution. The Assembly of IMO meets every two years that addresses women directly. And that uh, is to preserve the legacy of the World Maritime uh, theme we had in 2019, because a new theme came in in 2020, but we don't want to forget about it. We want to use the drive we had to uh, go further with uh, promoting women in shipping and ocean and fishing uh, related professions. And uh, last but not least, we have, uh, the organization works with um, permanent representatives from member states and quite a few of them are women and the number is increasing and has been increasing over the last few years. And they have also formed a network to um, promote the work of women in these shipping related areas and they are also very active in the organization and quite a few diplomats have, have joined in there. And that is in a nutshell what we are currently doing at IMO. The program is of course continuing and we are hoping to attract many more women to the profession of seafaring in particular but also everything that is related to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, interesting what you say about, uh, you know, there are, you need to get more and more people going into the shipping profession. Um, and women can be one uh, resource for that. But also I thought it was interesting that um, skills that people gain um, working on sea are very sought out on land as well. So, 
accessing um, a maritime profession um, can lead to a pipeline of all kinds of um, all kinds of opportunity and very interesting to hear about the impact and also the actions that you're taking to get women interested. Thank you very much. Um, and so now let's turn to a different ocean industry, which is offshore renewables. Um, Una Brosnan, you are the developer of new markets for mainstream renewable power. And um, obviously scaling up offshore renewable energy is gonna play a key part um, in meeting the climate reductions we need to meet the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, you know, and offshore wind has so much potential and so do renewables. Offshore wind um, can generate 40 times the amount that it does today. So this is an important um, opportunity and how can women play a part in this scale up? What role do they play? And how can we get more women to be a part of this growing industry? Una. Thank you, Suzanne. And yes, it's it's certainly a very interesting um, market to be in right now and very much at its infancy and, and a lot we can do here to influence and shape our market going forward. As Hendrik said, um, in evidence to date on, on global sectors highlights the importance and benefits of integrating women into the workforce. And it's no different for the blue economy. Um, gender equality, it simply makes business sense. It's smart economics. We need to get involved from early driving int integration and from the early inception of projects, whether it's de-risking developments, working with stakeholders, influencing governments from policy and, and energy frameworks, or working simply working at grassroots, um, you know, at, a, at an educator's level or influencing at the early stages and direction of our children's um, careers. I suppose raising the profile of what is offshore renewables, what is involved in offshore wind, how can I get involved in it, how what what skills get what skill sets are required. I think there's a lot of work to be done in raising the profile of, of the industry. Um, so one more more attention is being paid to the how important it is to have women in your workforce. There's a lot of work, as I mentioned, for us as an industry. And I am going to dwell quite a bit on raising that profile of the industry and how we can get people involved. Um, this, you know, a lot has happened in the last year. And I suppose the, the discussion around climate change and the impacts of the, the pandemic actually have played into our industry quite well. It's given us a time to, to I suppose, industry uh, stakeholders have, have got a chance to um, step back and take a breath and understand where our projects need to go, where are our gaps, and understand how best we take this forward and realize our objectives for 2030. So how can how can women be a part of this green revolution? Well, I think the you know there's infinite opportunity there, but again, it's raising the profile and where we can find the gaps. Um, as I mentioned, renewable energy is very much in its infancy, and although the maturity of the sectors has grown in some regions, considerable work is required locally, uh, globally, and here lies the opportunity of influence to shape the sector from its early stages. I think there's a particular opportunity in emerging markets and and here that is a, opens up a real opportunity for us to shape that and, and make sure that we extract the maximum value for an opportunity and open the doors for, for women to get into the workforce and really, really highlight this from an early grassroots um, perspective. I'm a firm believer that motivation in the workforce tends to come from working on things we love and really care about and, and working with passionate people and, and instilling that within our strong values within our teams. As mentioned, um, raising the profile of these opportunities is key and it's not dissimilar from anything um, that Heike mentioned, the challenges in getting people into the, the shipping industry. And I suppose highlighting the opportunities from transitions. I mean, we see the, tra the oil and ga gas transition um, challenge that's upon us at the minute. But equally, there's other um, industries which are keen to diversify their workforce and, and upscale or, or transition across into a new industry. So it's it's highlighting the, the, the I suppose, highlighting the opportunities and, and deriving a roadmap for, for industry to, to really make these happen. Flexible working, I think that is going to be key, uh, particularly in the offshore uh, sector, as like I said there, you know, the challenges and, and perceive, the perception about being working offshore. There is many opportunities on the onshore side. I mean, for me personally, I have never actually stepped off to an, onto an offshore platform. I have been on a boat out to see one. But I mean, there's so many opportunities from early inception, as I mentioned, around working on policy, engagement and collaboration with other projects. And cross-industry collaboration should not be underestimated. 
and really builds the foundation of the success of actually building out these projects. Um, there are a number of project or a number of programs in industry at the minute. And one, I suppose, personally, we have been involved in in um, in mainstream is the GWEC Women in Wind um, Leadership Program. Um, we've seen quite a bit as well within mainstream. We've developed our off the back of the GWEC involvement. We've we've um, set up our own Women in Renewables, which really, I suppose, puts an arm around some of our younger colleagues and makes sure that we are driving mentoring and networking and encouraging engagement uh, right across the company level and, and, and offering them an, an opportunity to step up and step in and help co colleagues in other industries as well to, to get vi visibility into our, our side. One area I would like to highlight as a really particular success and we're proud of in our industry it has happened in the UK where a recent offshore wind sector deal had a unique opportunity where it, it, it had an opportunity to embed equality and diversity and inclusion into some of its targets. So we're really, we're really striving for success and trying to embed about 40% of women employed in the sector by 2030. It is a challenge, but we're keen, keen to rise to the opportunity. So thank you very much. Thank you, Una. Yeah, interesting. You've got a, a, a very um, ambitious target. That's exciting yes. to hear about 40% of uh, the workforce um, represented by women. And also interesting what you were talking about, um, looking at the gaps and the opportunity around emerging markets and helping to shape the industry, but also showing that um, work in the offshore and the ocean actually can also work with um, lifestyles and that Absolutely. they are flexible working and, um, and yeah, uh, coming up with a model that works um, holistically. So that was really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, so now, if I may, let's turn to another ocean industry, which is about um, the food that we eat and aquatic food systems. And Shakuntala Tilstead, you are the global lead of nutrition and public health and aquatic food systems at World Fish in Malaysia. And actually, I know from uh, reading about you and um, studying you that you've played a pivotal role in promoting aquatic food systems for feeding nations, um, both at the international and the national level. Um, your work has made such an impact. So I wonder, please, could you share with us um, about how aquatic foods can contribute to gender equality and SDG 5? Thank you so much, Suzanne. And greetings to all from Penang, Malaysia. It's past midnight here. Thank you. Um, within aquatic food systems, and especially in inland and coastal fisheries, there is a high engagement of women. And it is estimated that about 47% of the 120 million people employed in the fisheries sector alone are women with the majority engaged in processing, for example, drying and smoking, and in trade, local, national, and across borders. We also know that this estimate is a gross underestimation, especially if we consider Sub-Saharan Africa. The challenges women face in aquatic food systems must be addressed at all levels. And there is also a need to challenge unequal gender relationships throughout the aquatic food systems. We do know that technology's improvements focus on those which benefit men. And one example I'd like to highlight, which can have benefits on women, is for example, the use of solar drying of fish instead of sun drying. This, if it, as, as is done in Malawi, where you have community solar tents and also small trans transportable family solar drying tents can improve the drying of small fish. It will give you a better drying process, use less time, no flies and contaminants, a be better safety of your products and less loss. And me this means that there'll be less time of a woman's work better products and higher prices. And we do know that higher income in the hands of women is used for, the for their children, getting their children more nutritious and better schooling. We should build on this to promote greater 
intake of fish by the women themselves so that they improve their own nutrition and health. I'd like to make mention of what we have seen now with respect to the disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We do know from the surveys we have conducted in aquatic food systems that women are more vulnerable than men when facing disruptions and shocks. And we do know their opportunities are more limited and that they take a longer time for recovery as compared to men. Thank you. Thank you very much for those observations. Um, really interesting that technology improvements often benefit men more than women and interesting to think about um, you know, our thought going into um, technology and how that in itself can advance um, gender equity and more access for people. And also um, to your point about um, more income going into the hands of women leads to um, better fed and, and better resourced children. So that is a, a definite benefit there. Um, but it's actually the perfect segue going into, um, as we shift to Flower Masuya, um, who is an, uh, an innovative entrepreneur and does think about how technology uh, in the ocean can impact women. And Flower, you are the chairperson of the Zanzibar Seaweed Cluster. You've lived and worked around the world in Finland, Israel, and currently Tanzania. And uh, you are an expert in innovation, particularly around aquaculture and particularly around seaweed innovation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the seaweed cluster that you have established and what brought you to setting it up? Yes, uh, hi everyone. I'm Flower Msua from Tanzania. Uh, actually, if you look at the uh, seaweed industry, most of the actors uh, in this industry are women. And uh, in Tanzania, for example, well above 80% of the farmers are, are women. And they, they, they farm and they share the benefits of farming with the, the, the men, with the youth, and with the other people in, in their families and na neighborhoods. We also see that uh, women are the most resilient in the industry. For example, in Tanzania, when seaweed farming started in 1989, many people went into farming seaweed. Men, women, youth, they all went into farming seaweed. But the others pulled out uh, slowly. They left the women there. And they pulled out because the, the work is, is hard and, they, and the, the pay is low. But the women remained there. And also when you look at the uh, impact of climate change, that brings the uh, into the seaweed farms. Women are more affected than, than the, the others. So, uh, but when we come to, to large uh, industries, uh, like uh, ownership of the uh, uh, export companies in Tanzania, for example, or the owners of the seaweed export companies are men. And those who are employed in, this, in these companies, they are also men. Even the seaweed collectors in the villages, they are uh, also men. So uh, when I looked at, at, at these, all these uh, women uh, producing seaweed every day and, and selling to the export companies at a very low Pay, and they're not even using their own seaweed that they produce. So I thought, how can I use my, 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 my research, my knowledge to help these women uh, improve their livelihoods? So I, that's when I started the Zanzibar Seaweed Cluster Initiative in 2006. Uh, the, the aim of the cluster initiative is to make the women uh, more innovative, more competitive, so that they can work in their seaweed industry. So in the, in the, in the cluster, we develop technologies to farm seaweed actually in the in, in deeper waters uh, where production is high so that the women uh, will produce more seaweed. The, we develop technologies for valorization, making seaweed products. Actually be, before 2006, when I started the cluster initiative, there was no seaweed, seaweed product at all in Tanzania. So, but now the women are making a lot of these seaweed products and selling at, at higher prices. And actually even selling the dry seaweed in retail prices they are still selling at higher prices and improving their, their, their income. We're also looking at, at markets for the seaweed and seaweed products. Uh, all this is, is geared actually to, to make uh, technologies in the market that will help the women. Whatever technology we, we develop, we make sure that it 
it favors the women, they can participate fully to enhance their livelihood in the civil industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it. Gosh, it's interesting that <laughs> the women were um, are, are doing the the hard physical work and getting um, not paid very much. Um, but the way the distribution is in terms of um, uh, revenue coming into the value chain is it tends to be more for the exporters and the men who own those businesses. So it's interesting how you and the seaweed cluster tries to address that. And I know some of the uh, some of the technologies that you looked at around uh, drying seaweed um, vastly uh, improves the revenue coming into um, coming to women on this and, and their share and access to the industry. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, great insights here from, from the perspective of your industries and sectors. And now it would be great to shift and hear more from the panel from a slightly more personal uh, standpoint um, about uh, gender equality um, in the ocean economy. So Henrik, you are a renowned ocean scientist. Um, you have female colleagues. Um, but why, in your view, is it important to have female scientists, particularly when it comes to knowledge creation? And what are your thoughts about how we can get more women into ocean science? Well, I, thanks so much. I mean, first of all, uh, the group I work with, we're about 20 scientists, and uh, we have never really promoted gender equity in our work uh, as a so, as a starting point, but it is a diverse group where half of the scientists are women, just because that's the diver it's that's the confidence we need. And it's a really that diversity helps us do a lot of different things. We have colleagues from a range of different uh, disciplines working from many continents and uh, having the dynamic uh, with both women and male yeah, and a diversity of competence really enables us to do a lot more. I've previously worked in, in daycare where were only women and in construction with only men and 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 there's something missing from workplaces like that so i think it's really obvious that in particular in in academia what i have more experience in diversity is key for good science but it's also clear that uh, in our younger colleagues uh, our students most of them are women our phd students as well most of them are women but then in our senior positions, uh, most of them are male. So we have mostly male professors. So just as, as Heike described, you have to create the space for empowerment. And you have to promote women uh, in uh, shipping industry. You also have to create the space for empowerment and, and support women promotion in, uh, in science. So we have worked quite actively with making sure that we are promoting women into leadership positions so that they can be role models for our younger scientists, female, and so that they also see that there is a path forward also for younger scientists into these senior positions. I think it's also really interesting that only a few years ago, it was perfectly normal to have scientific panels with only men in them, but that's something that's now not acceptable anymore. So I think it's really interesting to see how, how rapidly uh, the normal in science is shifting and how much attention has been spent the last few years in really making sure women are seen, that the skewed data are made visible, so that the institutions uh, are ashamed when they have too few female professors and not promoting females uh, sufficiently. So I think it's shifting quite rapidly in science, and I'm quite optimistic about the uh, opportunities scientists and scientific institutions have in really promoting women and illustrating that science and senior positions in science, that's something for everyone, not just, uh, just just white men, but really for everyone. So I think that's an exciting development, but of course it's taking a lot of time, but I think change is accelerating. So that's, that's very positive. Thank you very much. Yeah, norms are changing. Um, and some of the calling attention um, to the situation and, and, and making efforts to, to change it or evolve it, they, they do make a difference. Um, you know, let's talk about breaking some barriers and I'm gonna move to Heike, 
who is the first female director in the history of the International Maritime Organization. So wondering if you could share some thoughts or reflections on being the first, and also maybe what would your advice be to our younger women colleagues? Sorry, <laughs> forgot to unmute. Um, I have to correct you to start with Suzanne. I'm not the first female director in the organization. I'm the first female director of one of the technical divisions in the organization. And, and that's quite uh, extraordinary. And I have the feeling I'm, I'm almost at the end of my 40 years career in shipping. I have the feeling I will be also for a while uh, the, stay the only one. There is nobody coming after me, unfortunately. Um, in the International Maritime Organization, it is exactly as Henrik said about the uh, women in higher positions. If you look at the workforce, we have about 250 people working in the organization. About half of them are women. But if you go to the higher position, the number goes down, 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 down. And then in the director position of the uh, six directors we have, there are two women, uh, myself and uh, the, the women in charge of our conference division. Um, what do you have to do to succeed in shipping? Now, shipping being very male dominated, you have to have a lot of resilience and uh, yeah, can I call it bloody mindedness? Uh, even my father, when I started out, uh, tried to discourage me from, from this kind of career. He said, oh, that's nothing for a woman. You should do something like literature or languages, the, the more traditional uh, things there. But I was always very interested. I come from a family with a very long tradition in seafaring for hundreds of years. So it was only natural that I would tend to go into this field and since when I set out in the ninth when did I start to work <laughs> 40 years ago it was almost impossible for women to to actually become a seafarer so I thought okay I'm going to do something that is close to it and that's uh, I actually started shipping technology uh, with a specialization of fishing technology and uh, that uh, led to very interesting opportunities uh, for me during my career, culminating then uh, in IMO, uh, moving from Germany to London, starting out there with the family, the children being quite young at the time. It was actually quite an undertaking. So you need to be confident and you need to go for it. If you think you can do a job, most probably you can do it and then just, just go for it. It's, it's, um, it's not good to be afraid, and, but also you cannot let yourself be thrown by, by every remark that is made. I'm sure all of us women here at, at the panel have uh, experienced these, these discriminatory remarks or the, the yeah, patronizing remarks. Everyone has. You, you can, you, you should not take that too serious. You should just shrug it off and go on. I mean, it doesn't mean that you should accept everything that is said, but, but you need to move forward you know, with your direction. And I have also always found that it is good to have mentors. Most men are not anti-women. Most men are quite willing to share their experience and knowledge and help you along the way. And I have experienced this long my career quite frequently, actually. Uh, and that has helped me uh, enormously to get where I am now. And that's just a, a very personal account. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, having mentors, whether they be men or women, and also sponsors, so mentors to help coach and guide, but sponsors to actually stick their neck out and 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 you know help 
highlight you for the next position um, are are important too. But um, resilience, I liked I liked your comment um, about resilience, and I, and I'm sure if we had a lot longer on this panel, we each of us could go through and talk about um, some of our perspectives there. But congratulations, and also thank you for saying that actually if if you do want to do something, um, there are ways there are ways to do that. So um, very interesting. Thank you, um, Una. I want to turn to you now in the um, offshore renewable sector. Um, you know, in your company, um, can you talk a little bit about the strategy for your company in particular? And, mm -hmm. you know, are you guys doing a good job of incorporating gender equality into your strategy? Um, and what are some of the aspects there and maybe what would you like to see happen? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we're doing a really good job. I mean, what is at the heart of our company is team values. And I mean, whether it's specific towards women or it's, it's gender diversity, I think there's something there. Having core values um, at the heart of your company is, is going to add real benefit. We have, as I mentioned, we have a number of programs which are supporting specifically women. But I think that really is driven by our core values and that's where the benefit is coming in. And, you know, regardless of what other um, strategies and, and objectives we have to increase um, gender diversity across our, our, our regions, I think they all emanate and the, the foundations of them really lie within um, our, you know, wh where our views. I mean, if you look at the industry at the minute, um, you've seen some similar similar, similar um, drives by shareholders into companies where they've said, look, we don't, we don't want to invest in companies that are working in, in non-sustainable energy. You know, we really want to promote um, what's happening here and support the, the climate chain, a change action and support sustainable industries. Similar to that, that is happening when it comes to a diverse workforce. Shareholders do not want to be part of something which is, you know, looking at, a, you know, a one one element of, you know, the blinkers are on. We're only getting one view. They want, a, you know, they want a diverse mix at their boards. They want diverse mix across their their, um, you know, whether it's engineering teams or development teams, they want to make sure they've got the right people in the job. They've got a spread of skill sets right across the the the, the projects looking to de-risk, looking to trouble uh, troubleshoot through issues and making sure we've got the right people in front of governments and, and putting across the right image of what our industry is about. So I think it does. It comes down to core values and what we are about as a company. And I have to say, Adi O'Connor has been very passionate and very um, true to that within mainstream. Um, so that's a key one with residents for me. But I very much... Uh, I, I understand where Heike is coming from. My, my background is in construction as well. I worked in highways for many years before I got into offshore wind. You do have to be resilient. You do have to make sure that you're supporting other you know, individuals in your company and making sure that, you know, those little comments are not, you know, they don't, you don't dwell on them. You know, it's similar to what's happening in social media at the minute with, you know, the likes of trolls, just water off a duck's back, move on, lift yourself up. But I do think we need to put in a lot of effort when it comes to the leaky pipeline is what it's called and um, mid-level career support to, to women in industry. I suppose particularly that resonated within the engineering industry where I came from. Um, we saw a lot of people, a lot of women drop out of mid uh, mid career, and making sure that they're supported by employers. I think a lot of benefit could be um, could be extracted from there. Just making sure that you know when they return to the workforce, whether it's after starting a family or other otherwise, you know they have the right mechanism to support them through their next stage and next phases of their careers. Thank you very much. Um, you know, you, you talked about strategy being driven by your core values um, and also um, your, your, um, your, your strategy also being driven by what shareholders are now looking for and they're asking for a diverse um, workplace. So that, that really is a, a catalyst right now going on. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, your CEO setting the tone from the top and, and we hear over and over what a difference that makes when um, when that happens. And then, and then um, you know, something that we've heard all along today is addressing this leaky pipeline, as you call it, but um, encouraging people who are who are mid career um, to give them to give them a hands up. So, so now let's go back to um, flower and Zanzibar and um, 
you know, when you, your work comes, um, well, very much empowers women. And you talked a little bit about that. Um, what are women taking from it? And what are you taking from it? Tell us a little bit more continuing on from where you were before. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, the, the, in the, the seaweed cluster, uh, needs to continue actually to work, to work, uh, in areas where they can help the women to work to, to tap opportunities. For example, in the, in the blue economy uh, initiative. In, in the blue economy, for example, in Tanzania, there is now a, a newly formed uh, 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 Ministry of Blue Economy, which has a, a lot of opportunities. And when we talk of blue economy in the, in the aquaculture, we are talking about uh, farming in the open sea. So it means that uh, the, the, the seaweed cl cluster will continue to develop these technologies uh, that can be used to farm in the, in the open sea, expand on the technologies that they are already being uh, uh, developing for the, for, for the women to work together with men in the deep waters. And the, also there are uh, results of, of research. For example, the recent one is the Global Seaweed Star Project. Uh, one of the outputs of the Global Seaweed Star Project is a, is a seaweed disease manual that is, is being written in, in a local language in Kiswahili. And uh, there are also uh, biosecurity issues. What biosecurity practices can be, can be applied in the farms to, to increase the production? So the, the seaweed cluster, which is actually embedded into the community, uh, will use this, uh, uh, these uh, results of the, of the Global Seaweed Star uh, Project to bring to the to the community and to to, to use this to, uh, to for the women to, to to improve their livelihoods in the in the seaweed industry, and uh, also to continue uh, 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 developing all these opportunities, developing also the and actually while thinking uh, about uh, what can help the women. For example, if if in the civil industry you you, you develop the uh, market for refined carrageenan, which is the gel that is sold at a very high price, this will not help the women as much as developing market for the seaweed soap that the women are producing. It will not help them as much as they uh, constructing a processing plant in the industry in the country where the seaweed is farmed like, like Tanzania, where women can actually sell their seaweed and actually at a at, at higher price. So uh, it is for, for the seaweed cluster initiative, we'll continue to, to, uh, to work on these uh, technologies for, for, for farming and for valorization of the seaweed, to use the research res results, all this uh, actually focusing on where the w women can, be benefit, can benefit from the industry. Mm. You're muted, Suzanne. Sorry, thank you. But th th that that is interesting to focus on uh, where in the supply chain women um, can benefit. That opens up opportunities. And you talked about developing a processing or putting processing plants, you know, locally, so they can benefit from that added value there. Um, so it's using your research and then also your actions to um, develop the industry that they can access in that part. Um, and that's new. So, so we've heard from you about the role of aquatic foods in this case, seaweed um, and also Shakuntala um, talked a little bit before in advancing gender parity. But Shakuntala, you are the vice chair for Action Track 4 for the UN Food System Summit, which is coming up. And Action Track 4 is advancing equitable livelihoods. Um, can you tell us what we might expect? What are the um, advancements and the progress that we can make coming out of the summit? Um, around advancing SDG 5. Thank you, Suzanne. And as you know, the UN Food Systems Summit 2021 has five action tracks. And action track four is the only of the five which is solely addressing populations and addressing people. So action track five, the advanced equitable livelihoods, has a focus on population groups and specifically through the different um, uh, 
uh, meetings we have had, the different engagements we have had, we now know that the focus that people will like us to have on Action Track 4 is on women, indigenous peoples, and youth. So Action Track 4 gives us a natural entry to focus on gender equality and women em empowerment. And we would use Action Track 4 to prioritize solutions for the summit, which favor gender equity and women's empowerment. And this should not only be in the sphere of food production and supply chains, but across the entire food system. Also with respect to consumption of nutritious foods and with respect to policies by government and development agencies. Through Action Track 4, we will create platforms and engagements that position women at the forefront. We would like to give women the opportunities to be seen and to be heard in their own voices and in their own languages. They must be able to come together to make informed decisions, utilize technology to bridge traditional and modern technology and empowered about the importance of food and their roles in the food systems. Also, we would like to encourage the member countries of the United Nations to adopt recommendations for equitable livelihoods, such as those embedded in the Committee on World Food Security for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries. But this is just one of the many, many avenues for adopting guidelines. And if I could come to the action for now from the summit organizers, already now, we who are leading the summit should secure funding to be used for establishing the channels to make the voices of womanhood. This entails investing in technologies for example, radio, phones, cellular service, and created platforms. For example, supporting women's corporations, having the woman, pre having the woman being present at the present at the summit, where we are hoping that it's going to be uh, that people are going to be able to travel and attend the summit, but and ensuring that women are there at the summit and that their voices in their own language are heard. So we know we have to invest in things like, you know, having them create videos so they can tell their own stories, ensuring that there's translation from their language to, to, to English, for example. So right now, if I would give one action that we are looking for is to get the investments for these platforms so that we can bring the voices in person or through videos to the summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to hear that uh, increasing gender equity is, is a big part of the action track and also um, that your focus on getting women and their stories heard um, and getting the investments um, to, 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 to tell those stories and also to invest in technology around that. We look forward very much to what comes out of the summit and following that. Um, as a wrap up, I wondered if we could go around our panel and just quickly, but after all that we've heard today and what you've been thinking about and from your perspective, um, what could be your main recommendation from your sector or your business to advance gen gender parity in the blue economy? What would be the one thing you would like us all to take away with us to think about? Um, and let's go, let me start with Henrik, please. Yeah, thanks. I don't, I think empowerment is important, but it's not enough. We need men to also give up power and give away some of those senior positions also to women. So my one recommendations would be for all private companies involved in the blue economy to uh, strive for gender parity by their next board rotation. So creating space for women at the top, recruiting female CEOs and making sure that there are strategies for bridging that 
a critical mid-career gap so that there is uh, so all company are wel are welcoming women everywhere throughout all the steps of their career. Thank you. Let's go to Heike now. Thank you, Susan. Yes, I would just uh, say to all young women today, never accept the old fashioned traditional notions of what women can do or what they cannot do. Nowadays, all doors are open. So if you see opportunities for yourself, grab them and run with it. There is nothing that you cannot do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Una, please, for your thoughts. Thank you. Um, I suppose because our industry is quite in its infancy at the minute, and I mean, it is established in, in some you know areas like the UK and mainly in Europe um, for at the moment, but the emerging markets is such an opportunity and it's such an opportunity for us to get women involved and get involved early. So I think, you know, if you are involved in offshore wind at the minute, particularly, you know, work with your governments, work with your stakeholders, lift up those around you and and ex and really really give visibility to the opportunities in our industry it's not at the core you know it doesn't have to be at the core face of engineering or heavy development there are such wide opportunities and i think it's just get involved because it is it's a fast-paced exciting industry and i really cannot encourage anyone any anyone who's thinking of a change it's 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 not just for our generation it's for generations to come mm -hmm. Flower, may we hear your 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 parting your parting advice, please? Uh, when we think of the the seaweed industry, I would say is the use of continue use the, all the opportunities in the Blue Economy Initiative to develop the sections uh, that favor women in the seaweed value chain, uh, especially production of uh, technologies in in the in the open sea using this Blue Economy Initiative in the value chain. Thank you. Looking for the, the opportunities there in the value chain. Um, and Shakuntala, for just wrapping up for, for, for your advice or recommendation, please. Thank you, Suzanne. I would say documenting women's own voices on the multiple vital roles that the multitude of women play across aquatic food systems and making this evidence widely available to different stakeholders especially policy governments in national governments. Thank you, yes. Um, and, and letting governments hear what is important, um, what can be done and the success stories. So I'd, I'd just like to close by thanking you all. This has been an excellent session and I feel as though people watching this now um, and on future replays are gonna take so much from it, I, I know that I did. Um, when we think about the ocean in 10 to 20 years time, <clears throat> there's gonna be all kinds of new industries that are coming from it. You know, Lots of floating things, um, scaling up renewable energy. We're gonna see floating wind and solar all over the place. We'll see float floating infrastructure like tunnels and airports, and we'll see new pharmaceuticals. We'll probably see ocean mining. Um, we'll see massively scaled up aquaculture and seaweed. and Looking at some of the issues now is going to help us lay, lay a foundation for our future ocean and making it one that we can all benefit from. So I've learned so much from you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I hope you stay safe in these times and keep doing the work that you're doing. Thank you.